This episode of Ratchet and Respectable is brought to you by Hulu, celebrating Black history always. With stories like Women of the Movement, Snowfall, Atlanta, Grown-ish, Power, Living Single, the award-winning Summer of Soul, Hulu original Wu-Tang, and American Saga, and much more. Hulu highlights stories that showcase Black history, past and present, 365 days a year. Hulu subscription required. Terms apply. From Wondery. Even the rich pulls back the curtain on the lives of the rich and famous and takes a peek at the wild world of celebrity. In an all new season, they look at the strange and terrifying case of the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. One night, 19 year old college student Patty Hearst, who happened to be the heir to the Hearst newspaper fortune, was abducted from her apartment. She was kept in a closet for weeks while her captors demanded millions from the Hearst family. Then, in a shocking twist, Patty stunned the world when she walked into a San Francisco bank with a machine gun and robbed it with her captors. She was no longer Patty. She announced that her name was now Tanya. She would be a fugitive for a year before being arrested. When this cult-like band of criminals kidnapped Patty, she had to survive any way she could, doing things she never thought she would. Was she brainwashed or was she a victim of Stockholm Syndrome? Even the rich explores what was going on in the mind of Patty Hearst on her unpredictable journey from kidnapping victim to armed criminal. Now, what I love most about even the rich Patty Hearst is I thought I knew about this story, but listening to this podcast, oh my goodness, I have so much to learn. Follow Even the Rich on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or Spotify, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Setting new goals, creating and sticking to healthy habits, building a daily routine you can actually keep. Making these changes should be easy, right? Well, if you're not sure how or where to start, then it's time to try Fabulous. It's been a game changer for me. Fabulous is the habit changing app that gives you the tools and skills you need to feel healthier, more productive and fulfilled. Fabulous helps you break free of negative habits while helping you build new healthy ones that stick. Fabulous does this by using a holistic approach along with behavioral science. Unlike other health apps, Fabulous focuses on self-improvement, mental and physical health, mindfulness and productivity to build a daily routine that works for you. By using behavioral science, Fabulous breaks down scientifically proven healthy habits into a daily routine of very small tasks that you can easily achieve every single day. Say your goal is to be healthier. Fabulous breaks the goal down into daily tasks, like reminding you to drink water, exercise, or even disconnect and unplug. Fabulous also offers weekly challenges that complement the tasks I'm already doing in my regular routine. So say like the gratitude challenge. It helped me show gratitude to someone every single day for a week and helped me become more mindful. Becoming a Fabulous Premium member is also a total game changer. Premium gives you access to daily coaching content sessions, unlocks all guided behavior change programs, and lets you add as many habits as you'd like in your routines. It's so amazing how small changes can have a big difference. Simple reminders like drinking water and doing breathing exercises have really helped me improve my mental health. Start building your ideal daily routine today with Fabulous Premium. Get 25% off Fabulous Premium by going to thefab.co slash ratchet. That's T-H-E-F-A-B dot C-O slash ratchet for 25% off Fabulous Premium. Thefab.co slash ratchet. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and those who don't identify as either, you are listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. (laughs) So my my check has still not cleared. It's not clearing for another, what, eight days, I guess. So... When I have like money to spend, when I have like, you know, access to my accounts and disposable income, I be on some real tight budget shit. I'd be like, mm, do I need to order out? Mm, do I need to eat out? Mm, do I need this? Like, 
I've set up this savings fund for my Africa adventure. My idea in moving to Ghana is that like I will absolutely spend time in Ghana, but I will absolutely be using it as like quote unquote a base of operations to bounce all around Africa and see as many of the 54 countries that I possibly can. I've been keeping this dream list of things that I want to do for a little bit over a year. And so I've been setting aside a lot of my quote and unquote extra money into this fund. So I'm pretty responsible with my money. Like I, I save it, I invest it. I really try not to spend it on dumb shit. I got really great advice from my mentor years ago that was spend money on experiences, not things. So now that my ass is broke, like I see all the things that I want to buy. I saw this gold leather fringe purse earlier today and I was like, ooh, I want it. And then I saw like these beautiful black boots and I have no business buying beautiful black boots. Like one, I live in LA, like it's about to be 80 for the rest of the week. When do I need these boots? And then I'm talking about moving to Ghana. It's like eternal summer. Like it doesn't have winter. It has dry season and rainy season. I don't need these boots. I also don't need a gold leather purse. But it's like all of a sudden I see like all the things that I must have. Like I just, oh, I want, I want, I want and can't afford not nary of it right now. I ain't been this broke in a long time. I know it's temporary broke. I, I know I'm just waiting for a check to clear. But like just imagine your entire bank account is like in a cloud somewhere. Like I'm literally living off like emergency money literally for emergencies. I just, yeah. Uh I would love to give you an update on my life. Like, oh, these are the things that I did this weekend, but I did nothing because I cannot afford to do anything. I'm very grateful and thankful for like the many friends and strangers actually who listen to this podcast and were like, are you good? Like, do you you need money? (laughs) I'm fine. I'm not destitute. I did go to the flower market earlier today. I did get my weekly flowers. I'm not going to starve. I'm doing my errands tomorrow. I will put gas in my car and get my car washed and go to the grocery store. I don't have to significantly alter my life in any way. I'm just like, you know, my entire bank account is like in a cloud somewhere waiting to be cleared despite it being a cashier's check. I have to talk about something else before I get pissed off. Many of you have been DMing me. And asking me specifically to speak about this topic, I'm like, I don't really know what you want me to say. There was a sip and paint party. I don't know when it occurred, but video of it hit Twitter over the weekend. If you are not familiar with a sip and paint, I've been to one before. It is a party where naked men are stroll around the room and women paint canvases of the naked men in this video that has been circulating very heavily because I found it very easy on Twitter. I think I, I put in sip and paint suck dick and that's what came up from what I saw. It was a four second clip on a loop of a woman performing oral sex on one of the naked men at the sip and paint party. Now, when I went to the sip and paint party, It was not that kind of party. I mean, there were two naked men, very attractive naked men, walking around the room. And as I was painting, one did come up to me and, you know, I was sitting and he was standing and he came up and spoke to me. And so, you know, when I looked to the right, like his man meat was like eye level, but not mouth level. And, you know, he stood there and he critiqued my work and he thought it was very nice. The canvas that I had had like an outline of a man's form. It was a white canvas with like a black outline. The man was brown. So I painted, you know, the man brown. The guy who I was painting, he had like, you know, some hair. So like I painted some hair and then I put the man in like some nature because he's naked and I was giving him like black Adam. I just painted some like, you know, what looked like bushes behind him. Um, But I had not painted his penis because, you know, there's, it it was, it was a different color than the rest of him and it, it, it wasn't getting as much sun. And so I wanted to use the most of the brown paint 
for the man. And then I wanted to use different brown paint, especially where he was cut to, you know, give it as much realism as possible. So the man came over to me and he critiqued my painting and he was like, it's very nice. Oh, you put me in nature. He was like, that's nice. And he was like, but sis, like you, you didn't paint the veins in my dick. And I was like, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Cause like the man's penis is like, you know, at my eye level. Now he's telling me about like veins in his dick. I turned and I look. And so he just sort of like thrust it forward so I could get a better look so that I could paint more accurately the veins in his penis. And, and I did. It was a very nice painting. I was staying with my parents at the time and I hung it up in the guest bedroom. My mother thought that was so funny. She was like, this is ridiculous. Pun not intended. That was about the extent of shenanigans at my paint and sit party. I remember after the party, I guess it was ending. Things were wrapping up. We'd had a lot of champagne. I asked one of the gentlemen if I could take a picture with him. And he was butt ass naked. And so like I tried to like use my canvas to like hide his penis in the picture. And he was like, you ain't got to hide my dick. And then my friend who was taking the picture was like, she's going through a divorce. And he just he picked me up and grabbed me and. My ponytail was swinging all over the place and I threw my head back and my leg up. I mean, not on him. I just literally just threw my leg up. My knee. Like I bent my knee back, like a little kickback, not like a wraparound. Respectable. But that was the extent of the crazy, oh no, the guy did like swing his dick in a circle. Okay, but now that is the extent. That is the extent of the crazy that happened in my paint and sip party. No one that I saw enveloped a penis with their hands, mouth, vagina, or anything else. People were very respectful of the men. They were flirty, but they weren't, like, pornographic. But in the video, like, people are lined up, like, sitting at, like, like, long tables. Everyone's all seated together. People on each side of the table, like, think maybe sitting family reunion style at a picnic table, something of that nature, where there's people on both sides, right? Three. So say there's, like, a picnic table, and there's three people on one side and three people on the other side, right? One of the women in the middle just turned around and started sucking dick. And the thing that really got me crazy was that no one else was reacting to this woman sucking dick in the middle of the event. It wasn't like, you know, she was off in the corner that like they were trying to have some sort of like, you know, discretion about what they were doing. Like the woman was just like turned around sucking dick at a really weird angle. I was like, that doesn't look comfortable, but I, I, I was confused. If that's what you like to do, then no judgment. But like people, please literally get a room or go to a car, something, a closet, something. But you don't just like suck dick in the middle of a room. That's ratchet. And then why wasn't anybody reacting? If I was sitting next to someone who started doing that, like I would want to move further away. There was a woman sitting across from her who seemed fine and not outraged. There was a woman sitting next to her who seemed fine and now not outraged. Was this like maybe they were filming a porno or something? Because I know that's like, you know, a thing in porn where it's like, you know, male strippers. But even in porn, when it's like the male stripper and he goes around the room and like random women are like, you know, performing oral sex on him. They put a towel over the person's head or they put up like a little blocker so like everyone can't see. And then like the cameras on the other side. There's still like some discretion and decency to it. I was like, this was just like sucking dick in the open room. I was appalled and it takes a lot to appall me. Like, even though I might be a little on the conservative side, I don't, I don't really react in shock to a lot of things, but I was like sucking dick in the middle of a party, even like a party with like, you know, okay, everybody's naked. It also doesn't even strike me as hygienic. Like I just don't feel good about it. But that video was all over Twitter. And I was like, who taped that? Like you saw somebody doing it and then like you whipped out your phone And that's the other part. I was like, somebody saw it happening and whipped out their phone to record it. So like the people around them would have had due time to notice what was happening and react. But no one seemed to be reacting. I just, I'm confused about the whole thing. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, that's got to be Atlanta. I like Atlanta. I like Atlanta. I remember at one point I was talking about moving to Atlanta. I went down to Atlanta as part of my odyssey over the summer. And I was like, if I move here, I will turn into a hoe or be married to one. I cannot move to Atlanta. You see, after I went there this summer, I stopped talking about moving to Atlanta. I was like, I can't. I just, I can't exist in this place. But as soon as I saw that video, and I have no idea where it was, I think it was Atlanta. Because that just seemed like some Atlanta shit. I'm not saying Atlanta's ratchet. 
Not all of it. A good portion of it. And don't be coming on here getting mad at me because you know Atlanta is. But yeah. I guess since we're talking about crazy sex shit, we might as well just, you know, get everything out the way at once. AJ Johnson. Remember AJ Johnson? Uh, Mama's Gotta Have a Life Too. House Party, AJ Johnson. She went on Angela Yee's Lip Service podcast and they were having a great conversation about sex and such. And ma'am, she's 58 now. She jumped out with a story of her 50th birthday. I actually met her for the first time. We'd never met before. Um, when I was in Ghana, we were staying at the same hotel. She's actually living out there now. I don't remember how long she said she'd been out there. I want to say it was like a few months. She went on Angela Yee's podcast last week and she started talking about her 50th birthday in St. Bart's. And she was talking about how she had a threesome. And I was like, oh, she said the two guys were friends. They were black men from France who only spoke French during the encounter. And I'm reading this on, on essence.com. And AJ Johnson said that she speaks French fluently. So she knew that was going on. She said the French language, as well as the Patron they were drinking made the experience romantic and sensual. And then she clarified, she was like, it was never them together. So it was never like all three of them at the same time. But she said the men were flip flopping me. And she said, it was like, oh my goodness. It was like doing the salsa. I was like, is that what we're calling it now? It was like doing the salsa with two guys at the same time. Just romantic and sexy and never intertwined. But at the same time, it was two. She she described her experience as effortless and so sexy, but sexy not in a sexual way. It was sensual. She said the men were very gentle. They treated her like a queen. It wasn't freaky. She said, quote, it wasn't like an internet porn site crap. It was just very sensual, sexy, and romantic. I've never had the desire to, to do a threesome. I watch it in like a porno or something, but it's not really what does it for me. It's something that I might watch, but I don't fantasize about doing. That's just not my, that's just not my thing. But I was like, oh, Okay, Madame Johnson. I mean, she's 58 now. This is something that happened like eight years ago and she's still talking about it. So I'm going to guess she had a good ass time. I believe I read that she said that she would do it again. Okay, I'm reading further down in the article right now. She said that, that she and the guys, they had more than one threesome encounter. It wasn't just her birthday. They did it again the day after. She said the next morning, she said, we all went to breakfast. It was like three friends that hung out and had a good time. It was weird because it was not like I was into that. I had never done it before, but it was happy birthday to me. As it was happening, I was like, this is happening. This is actually happening. Then I just kind of relaxed and let it happen. The next morning, we were like three musketeers. And I was like, so what time tonight? Oh. Now, the Essence Reader, at least on Facebook, they were letting her have it. And they were like, ma'am, you talking about these men, these men ran a train on you? And I was like a threesome, a train, a, a, a tango or a salsa, whatever she called it. She seemed to be enjoying it. So I was like, well, good for her. Oh, sometimes you think that, you know, it's a new generation of people who just started doing wild shit. Not quite. Folks of a certain age usually just don't talk about their shit. But she's 58 talking about some shit she tried for the first time at 50. A lot of the Essence readers were like, ma'am, you are oversharing. This is not things that you should be telling people. You should keep this in your bedroom. Yeah, she felt like sharing. And, you know, I think probably I appreciate that she shared. Part of the reason I appreciate that she shared it is because so many people think that women's lives are over. I was going to say 40, but I really think like 35. It's like so weird. People are like, oh, if I don't do X by 30, if I don't do X by by 40. And I'm like, well, what happens like when you turn 40? Does like, does it? Does like, do you die? I don't think I really paid attention to it until I was watching people react to sex in the city. And they were like, what is this show going to be about? Like old women having sex. And I was like, do you think old women do not have sex? Do you think sex is just for like the under 40 crowd? Like, I'm, I'm confused. Like, where, where are we going with this? So I love that she had a threesome at 50. I don't, I can't see it for myself. Threesomes, plural, at 50. You know, when I first heard this story, my friends sent it to me. One of my friends who was also in Ghana with me sent it to me. And they were like, yo, is this what she doing over in Africa? 
This was before we read the story. If you're like, no, she's in St. Bart's. But I was like, you know. Also, she looks no parts of 58 in person. Whatever I thought 58 was supposed to look like, she looks freaking amazing. So I was like, oh, is threesomes at 50 only for like the people who look fucking amazing? Or, or is like anybody can do that? Asking for a friend. Online shopping isn't slowing down anytime soon. Is your business ready to keep up the pace? With ShipStation, you'll never have to worry about shipping again. Make the switch to a solution that handles all your shipping needs quickly, affordably, and painlessly. ShipStation is already trusted by over 100,000 e-commerce sellers, including me. Now, my favorite thing about ShipStation is how easy it is. Plus, it saves me time by funneling all my orders into one simple interface. I also get to save money. My business can access the same discounted rates usually reserved for Fortune 500 companies. Knowing your orders are handled and you're getting the best rate, it's no wonder 98% of companies that use ShipStation for a year keep using it for as long as it's in business. It's that good. Ship more in less time with ShipStation. Use my offer code RESPECT to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no-hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in RESPECT. ShipStation. Make ship happen. Kick off 2022 with a better checking account with no monthly fees. Chime, an award-winning app and debit card, has no overdraft fees, foreign transaction fees, monthly fees, or service fees. With over 60,000 fee-free in-network ATMs at many locations, like most Walgreens, 7-Eleven, CVS, and more, you can access your money when you need it, where you need it. And what I love most about Chime is you can also send money to anyone, even if they aren't on Chime. Fee free for you and no cash out fees for them. Make your first good decision of the new year and join over 10 million people using Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at Chime.com slash Ratchet. That's Chime.com slash Ratchet. Banking services provided by and debit card issued by the Bancorp Bank or Stride Bank North America. Members FDIC. Get fee-free transactions at any MoneyPass ATM in a 7-Eleven location and at any AllPoint or Visa Plus Alliance ATMs. Otherwise, out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Sometimes pay anyone instant transfers can be delayed. The recipient must use a valid debit card or be a Chime member to claim funds. What else is going on? The Sip and Pain, AJ Johnson... We got a juicy episode this week, kind of. Some of this shit I just don't care about. Oh, I don't have Nick Cannon on my list, but I guess I just need to acknowledge it because people keep sending me stories about Nick Cannon. He's having his eighth child. Pictures recently circulated of him celebrating um, yet another child on the way. Nick had said at one point that his therapist had told him to stop having sex and that he was like out of control. This baby was apparently conceived before the therapist told him that he needed to, you know, lock down his loins. And this baby was also conceived before the death of his recent child. And he said that the mother of the child and he didn't say anything because they wanted to be respectful of the mother of the child who just passed away. I don't know what y'all want me to say about Nick Cannon's loins. I think that that he's spreading himself a little thin. I understand that he has lots of money and and lots of jobs. I do understand that he can financially support a bunch of children in different households. But I think it takes more than finances to rear children properly. Like you need to be present, consistently present. And I don't know how you do that running from household to household to household to household. That's what I've got about Mr. Cannon. I wish him the best. I hope that his his talk show and, and the other shows that he hosts, I mean, the man does keep a job, but he will have to keep a job trying to support like all these different kids. And I also read that he said he wasn't ruling out more children. I saw him posed up with a picture today. It was a vending machine of Magnum condoms, which sometimes you see people with Magnums and be like, like everybody wants to, you know, pretend they can, you know, fit a Magnum. Some of y'all dudes being baggy Maggies. But Mr. Cannon... 
We have seen his cannon. He might need more than a magnum. I'm like, does it does that fit? Because he was um, how do I say this? Blessed. He was very blessed. Very, very, very blessed. I do understand why women are having sex with him. I just don't understand why everyone refuses to like use a condom and why he refuses to pull out. I just. Speaking of black fathers, Kanye West is, has put himself in the news. It's not like he he just it's not like he just popped up in the news. Kanye West is is continuing to put himself in the news. His latest antics are using his Instagram platform where he has about 10 million followers to blast the parenting skills of his estranged wife. Previously, he was doing lives about like not being invited to one of the children's birthday parties only for us later to discover that he wasn't invited because he was throwing his own party later that day or the same weekend, whatever. The latest thing is Kanye has, is upset that his eight-year-old daughter, North, his oldest child, is on TikTok. And he doesn't think that she should be on it, which I don't think that she should be on it. However... However, Kanye screenshotted video of North on TikTok and posted it on his Instagram page, again, to 10 million followers to complain about his wife allowing the child on TikTok. And I was like, I didn't even know North was on TikTok until Kanye posted the picture. I'm like, you're complaining about your kid being on social media. And I said this on the last episode, you're, you're complaining about your kid being on social media by putting her on social media. Huh? This is all a thinly veiled. What's the word? Not even an attempt, a a thinly veiled way to antagonize Kim. She's doing something that he doesn't agree with. A lot of people don't think that an eight-year-old should be on TikTok. So people agree with him about this issue. But the way he's going about it, I'm like, sir, like you don't have lawyers. He's posting this stuff on the internet and he's asking for random people to weigh in. And I'm like, some people can't afford a lawyer. So they're asking you like their peer group, like, has anybody been in this situation? Like, what should I do? You can afford lawyers. You can afford a team of lawyers. Like you have billions from what you've been telling us. Go get a fucking lawyer and ask them what to do. But he was like, this is my first divorce, so I don't know what to do. How do I get my, you know, estranged wife to, you know, get my eight-year-old daughter off TikTok? Kim finally responded to him, and she's ignored, like, most of his antics thus far. So he made reference to her first divorce. She made reference to his third lawyer. Um, She also said that, you know, North is on TikTok because it makes her happy. Um, It's done so with her supervision. It was pretty, it was a pretty classy response. She says, um, quote, Kanye's constant attacks on me in interviews and on social media is actually more hurtful than any TikTok North might create. I am doing my best to protect our daughter while also allowing her to express her creativity in the medium that she wishes with adult supervision because it brings her happiness. Divorce is difficult enough on our children and Kanye's obsession with trying to control and manipulate our situation so negatively and publicly is only causing further pain for all. From the beginning, I have wanted nothing but a healthy and supportive co-parenting relationship because it is what is best for our children. And it saddens me that Kanye continues to make it impossible every step of the way. I wish to handle all matters regarding our children privately, and hopefully he can finally respond to the third attorney he has had in the last year to resolve any issues amicably. Kanye lashed out at her again after that response, and he said that he feels like he's the one being controlled. And he says, America saw you try to kidnap my daughter on her birthday by not providing the address. Is that is that kidnapping? Not giving the father the address to the party that you didn't know he was coming to or didn't want him at because of his erratic behavior? I don't that's that's not the definition of kidnapping, sir. He came back with some more shit about her. He wants to take the kids to Chicago for some sporting event and she won't let him. And so he was like, what part of joint custody is this? I was like, that's really not how joint custody works. Like you have to have an agreement. You can't just take the kids whenever you want to take them. 
something else. Like she accused him of stealing from the house. It's just this nonstop drama. He said he took some comic books that he left behind. And I was like, sir, sir, if you don't live in the house anymore, you taking stuff out of the house, the, even the stuff that you think is your stuff, it's not. You don't live there anymore. You can't just roll up in the house and go take shit because you're like, I want it. Like, that's not how it works. You know what I really hate about Kanye West? I'm not the biggest Kim Kardashian fan. He's making me feel empathy for Kim Kardashian. I don't like having to defend Kim Kardashian because he is being so damn crazy. Also, this is kind of where shit gets, I mean, not that all of this shit is not off the rails, but this is when it goes like further off the rails. He starts criticizing his mother, his deceased mother, who he just had that big album that he named after her. He says, my mother took me to Chicago when I was three and told my dad if he came to Chicago, he would never see me again. He says that's why he bought the house next door to Kim. He said, I dream of a world where dads can still be heroes. I was like, are you, are you publicly criticizing your deceased mother in order to attack Kim or justify your attacks on Kim? Really, nigga? Really? All of this is playing out. And I saw this meme circulating earlier and they were like, could somebody tell Kanye and Kim to please like take us out of the group text? Like delete us. The public is not part of your group text. And it's not really Kim. Kim has gone months without responding publicly to Kanye's nonsense. He po- and she finally responded after he like publicly questioned, actually the second time, second or third time that he's publicly questioned her, her mothering skills. Because I think he said before something like the nannies were raising the children. He also has been posting texts from, from Kim's family members. Um, there was this one woman who reached out to say like she agreed with him. And then she asked for a pair of Yeezys. He called out another cousin that, that called him and said that, you know, she agrees with him. She sides with him against Kim. I was like, sir, this is so messy. This is so messy. Like to people from the outside looking in, this is like Kanye TM celebrity and Kim Kardashian West TM celebrity going back and forth. But like y'all are real people with real kids. You calling out Kim's cousins and posting these text messages, that's like fucking up family relationships. Those people that you're calling out are kin to your kids. This whole thing is just a hot ass mess. And I'm like, sir, one, don't bring your mom into it. Leave your mom out of it. But also just like get this shit off the internet. This is not our business. This shit is just messy. I hope he takes his meds first and foremost, but I hope they can figure this all out for the sake of the kids. Cause like your parents going back and forth like this, which also, also I think is worth noting. Connie has a documentary coming out on Netflix. I think it's sometime this month. And also on his page, he's promoting Donda 2, which dropped February 22nd. So I'm not sure how much of this is actually shit he really cares about, or if this is just publicity for his upcoming project. Kanye is very, very good at keeping his name out there. He's also in a huge feud with Netflix um, because I think they won't give him final approval of his documentary. Um, And he just posted something about how he wants Drake to narrate it. Sir, this must be exhausting to live your life in this much public conflict. Even if it's just like some shit that you're doing just for people to pay attention. Just the energy of just this constant bullshit constantly keeping things going constantly like trying to feed this beast of people like talking about you and being interested in you good bad ugly and different like he seems to be one of those people that believes all publicity is good publicity i'm like sir you look like unbalanced perhaps he is like he has said that he's bipolar he has said that he he doesn't like to take his meds but in the meantime he's like inflicting chaos on the mother of his children and basically in every part of his life. I mean, you're in flux with your children. You're now dragging your deceased mother. You got issues with Netflix. You won't talk to your lawyers. It's actually very classic, like man going through divorce. Men go crazy when women leave them. A lot of this strikes me as not even like a bipolar or mental health flip out. Um, It strikes me as Control and manipulation on some you left me and now I will make your life a living hell for leaving me. Um, Not so long ago, it was kind of public. 
if you followed me on social media, it was my friend was going through a divorce and her husband, for some bizarre reason, blamed me for it. I never said anything about like divorce him, leave him. She started posting like erratic stuff on her page, on one of her Instagram pages. And I texted her and asked like, hey, is everything okay? Like, did your, did your site get hacked or something? Because like, I see your comments, like people are flipping out because of the content that you're posting is so different from what you usually share. And her husband saw my text to her. And mind you, I had no idea what was going on between them. But her husband saw what I shared and said that, that me sending her the text asking if everything was okay, he says that caused his wife to question his leadership and that's why she left him. I was like, what? She actually did leave him for reasons that totally unrelated and have absolutely nothing to do with me asking, did your site get hacked? But the hell that he inflicted on her and her friend circle. I mean, there were police, there were restraining orders, like we was all sorts of hoes, bitches, whatever information they had pillow talked about as married people. He started putting that shit out there, like crazy shit. All because he's mad that she left him. Like he tortured everyone. It was pure hell for months. Isn't that like statistically how that plays out? The most dangerous time for women who, um, who have been victims of domestic violence leaving is actually the most dangerous time in those situations. There's never been any accusation that he hit Kim. But emotional abuse, I mean, I think that's what we're watching play out right now. He's doing everything he can to antagonize her um, and publicly humiliate her. I really hate this man for making me feel bad for Kim and having to spend a whole episode talking about them. Let's move on to another subject. I'm so sick of talking about Kanye. In other what the fuck news, I think I told y'all this before. A couple years ago, like when I first moved to LA, there was this production company that was interested in turning Ratchet and Respectable into a TV show, like a talk show type thing. One of the segments that they wanted to do, which at the time I thought was kind of terrible, but in retrospect, I'm like, actually that might've worked. But it was a segment called White Wine. And so every week I would talk about the annoying shit that white people do. (laughs) I say all that to say... The president of CNN was, he said resigned. I think ousted is probably a better word. Jeff Zucker, if you remember, is, he's the president of CNN Worldwide. That's his former title. He's also known as the guy that fired Chris Cuomo. If you recall, Chris Cuomo was fired because he was too involved in advising his brother during his brother, Governor Cuomo of New York, during his brother's sexual harassment, sexual assault scandal. He was using privileges that he had as a journalist, particularly as a widely known, respected, well-connected journalist on CNN to get intel for his brother. So CNN let him go. Chris's contract with CNN, I believe, had a couple years left on it. And Chris wants his money. CNN was like, we're not paying you money because you violated the ethics and morality clause, which means you're in breach, which means we don't have to pay you out. I don't know if there's an active lawsuit that Chris has filed against CNN for not paying him. I do know he has lawyers and the lawyers wanted some information from CNN. I also know from what I read that CNN had been doing its own internal investigation of the reach of the fallout from Chris being inappropriate in advising his brother and helping his brother. So in the process of investigating the fallout from Chris, it was discovered, and I'm not really sure by who, The early article said that it was discovered that the president of CNN was in a relationship with this woman that's referred to as his lieutenant. She's also like a high up at CNN. Zucker is technically her boss, but she's high ranking at CNN as well. Apparently, they've been in this relationship. They said it was new and it began in COVID and they just didn't disclose it. Other people have come out. They were like, it was an open secret that they were together. This isn't new news. 
They've been sneaking around for years and years and years. Apparently, Katie Couric wrote about it in her book years ago. But he was married to someone else. She was married to someone else. And they ended up living in the same apartment building. I want to say she had the apartment on the floor above his. So it ain't a new relationship and everybody knew about it. So when the story first came out that he was being fired or he resigned, I can't remember what the initial spin on it was. But when they said that he was that he was no longer going to be the president of CNN, like that's the easiest way to say it. I was like, he's getting let go over that. Because I feel like that's one of those things, like that fraternization policy. That's one of those things that people enforce when they want to enforce. And it's also one of those things where they use that to get rid of you when they want to fire you for something else, but they don't have the real just cause. So they're like, oh, well, you know, this is something. You fuck this up. Okay, so we're going to let you go. Feels That's what that felt like. But then, after a little more digging, folks start putting two and two together. And they're like, hey, 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 hey. It's not just as simple as, you know, these two people breaking a fraternization policy. The other thing, too, is the head of CNN is gone, whether he was let go or whether he resigned. He's gone, but the woman he was in the relationship with is still there. That's weird, right? Okay. The head of CNN, Zucker, was in this relationship with this woman named Allison Golust. Golust. G-O-L-L-U-S-T. Allison used to work for Andrew Cuomo as his communications director. So you fired Chris, the brother of the man who used to be the boss of the woman that you're dating secretly. You fired Chris because his morals and ethics were fucked up and he's violating his contract. Meanwhile, Your morals and ethics are also fucked up and you're violating your contract. Huh? Now that it's come out that this woman used to be Cuomo's communications director, now there's some question as to whether Zucker was also involved or how involved he was with Cuomo's scandal. And I'm reading this part on New York Magazine and they're saying that in fact, a source told Rolling Stone that Zucker and his girlfriend had also advised Andrew Cuomo at the beginning of the COVID pandemic in ways not so dissimilar as to what led to Chris Cuomo's dismissal. So they weren't advising him about the scandal. And the issue with Chris Cuomo doing that was that you're a journalist who's giving advice to someone who's in the middle of a major news story. And in that sense, you are affecting the outcome of the news. If they were advising Cuomo in the same way about COVID, like you're affecting, you're doing the same thing. You're affecting the outcome of the news. It's a whole hot ass mess. And and the other part of this too is the question is, how did this story come to light? Because it seemed like everybody and their mother knew what was going on. There's also been several reports that Chris Cuomo was like, essentially, run me my money or I'm airing everybody out. Apparently, there's more to come. Let me see if I can find that article. I'll see if it was Chris Cuomo's threat. This is at the Washington Post, and they ran a story. They said CNN staffers raised questions about Chris Cuomo's connection to Jeff Zucker's ouster. They said new stars loyal to the CNN president are frustrated that his resignation was triggered by a looming legal showdown with a scandal-plagued former anchor. This investigation about Cuomo was done by an outside law firm, and they discovered the relationship. And I also think it's worth noting that several CNN people, political correspondent Dana Bash being one of them, she said, for a lot of us, and this is about Zucker, she said, the feeling is the punishment didn't fit the crime. New York Magazine had a story about all the anchors that have come out in support of Zucker, including Jake Tapper, who they were like had a whole event at his house for people to come and mourn Zucker's ouster. So so in the Washington Post piece, they talk about um, inside CNN. People are saying that Chris Cuomo was a man scorned because he was fired for being held accountable for his actions and they think that he is going after Jeff Z- and they think that he is going after Jeff Zucker um, in retaliation. 
clearly somebody has gone after Zucker. I don't think that people just knew. I don't think this has been an open secret for like all these years. Some say as many as 20. But the same thing I said with about Andrew Cuomo and then again about Chris Cuomo, like, you know, it might be a political hit. Somebody may be going after you. Somebody may be digging up dirt on you and spreading it to lead to your downfall or inconveniences for you in some way. But did you do this shit or not? They can't weaponize against you shit that you didn't do. Did you do it? You did it. Like, I totally agree that I think like being in a consensual romantic relationship is not something that should lead to being ousted or or being asked for your resignation, forced to step down, essentially. I think that that's blowing it out of proportion. I think for a consensual relationship, that's like a heavy price to pay. But again, you know, you sign the contract and this is what you agreed to do and somebody didn't want you to do it anymore. And now they're using that that little paragraph in the contract that everyone overlooks and no one really thinks anybody's going to make a big deal about. Now they're using it against you. CNN seems to be like in a free fall. I don't know if it's the accents or the tea or the driving on the wrong side of the road, but no matter what it is, I love British TV and I'm getting my fill and then some thanks to Acorn TV. Acorn TV is the largest commercial-free British streaming service that features compelling stories, exclusive premieres, and originals you won't find anywhere else. Acorn TV has hundreds of exclusive shows from around the world, including award-winning mysteries, dramas, comedies, history, and so much more. The series you find on Acorn TV are cleverly written, visually striking, and feature renowned actors and hosts like David Tennant and Mary Barry. I'm currently binging Under the Vines, starring Charles Edwards from The Crown. This dramedy follows two unlikely city slickers who inherit a failing vineyard in rural New Zealand. Despite neither ever having done a hard day's work and both despising the other, they must somehow make the vineyard successful so they can sell up, split up, and get out of rural New Zealand. You get thousands of hours of new enthralling content on Acorn TV for a fraction of the cost compared to most streaming services at just $5.99 a month. And I love how easy it is to stream Acorn TV on all my favorite devices. With Acorn TV, I always get my British fix and you can too. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code RATCHET. But you have to enter the code in all lowercase letters. That's A-C-O-R-N dot TV, promo code RATCHET, to get your first 30 days for free. Acorn dot TV, code RATCHET. The first time I knew that Curology was working for me is when I started getting compliments on my skin. Curology is a game-changing custom skincare made for you by a dermatology provider. They'll create a custom prescription cream for your specific goals, whether that's tackling acne, clogged pores, skin texture, dark spots, fine lines, or something else. You start by taking a short online skin quiz and uploading photos. And if it's a good fit, they'll ship you your formula right to your door. It even has your name on the bottle. For me, I just wanted to clear up my skin. I tried so many products and none of them ever worked until I began using Curology. I loved how simple the process was to figure out what would work for me and that the product shipped right to my door. Get started with Curology just like I did with a free 30-day trial at Curology.com slash ratchet. Just pay $5 for shipping and handling. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash ratchet to start your free 30-day trial. Cancel anytime. Prescription subject to consultation. Never get tired of a good whodunit? Then you'll love June's journey. You play as June Parker, an amateur detective investigating a series of mysteries full of twists and turns around every corner. You'll put your powers of observation to the test, sharpen your sleuthing skills, and relish the thrill of solving the case. Whether you're craving a good mystery or just need to get away for a while, June's Journey is the perfect game for you. You'll search for hidden clues to solve mystery after mystery across thousands of vivid scenes. And with new chapters every week, there's always a new case waiting to be cracked. 
I love how much this game makes me think. It's a great way to unwind when my mind is worrying. There is a detective in all of us. Find your inner detective. Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. What else do we have? Oh, we have Madame Kiara Shear. Madame Kiara Shear. I don't know what she was thinking. Um, Kiara Shear, if you're not familiar with her, is a gospel singer. She's like gospel royalty. Kiara Shear did this interview speaking to page six. I don't even know what her project is. Like, why was she speaking to page six? I've seen a lot of talk about Kiara Sheard. I've seen no talk of whatever it was she was promoting when she went to speak to page six. But somehow in this conversation, they got on the topic of her boundaries as a, her boundaries with her friends as a married woman. And so she went on to say that her mother had given her advice that you can't let another woman into your household, specifically single friends. This is what she said. Look, don't have too many people around your house. Don't get comfortable. I don't care how good you trust or whatever it is. I'm very mindful and careful. I would buy a friend a hotel room before I let them stay at my house. However, I am a prayerful woman to discern the space that I am in. I'm also very cautious of what purpose I'm supposed to serve in this person's life. While I am very prayerful, I'm always also asking God outside of my mother to direct me. In this season, am I supposed to let them into my home? Because we as believers, we believe that what we have, we are supposed to share with others. But I'm not sharing my man. Since I'm not sharing my man, I have to be cautious with everything else that I share as far as with him being there too. That's a lesson that I get. And I think it's such a thing as a balance that goes to why we have to have wise friends, encourage our friends too. You know how they say a lot of single women, they can't give you counsel, but I was single. I was able to tell my married friends good advice. I definitely think it's such a thing as boundaries. I'm reading this part on Essence and they make a point to say that like while this part wasn't in the video interview, because I guess that part that I just read was that Kier is also quoted as saying some friends don't know that balance and can't understand that balance. I've seen so much commentary about this quote and it's, it's often reduced to I'm sending my friends to a hotel because they can't stay in the house with me and my husband and the implication being that Either she doesn't trust her friends or she doesn't trust her husband or both. Reading this quote, it sounds like a bunch of what? Like it doesn't make sense. She's stringing a whole bunch of thoughts together and it just, it sounds like just like a word salad. I really don't understand exactly what she's saying. But I do think that the overall gist of it is unfortunately, like I had hoped that people were exaggerating what she said. I do think the overall gist of it is I don't allow my single friends to stay at my home because I don't want to share my husband. And I was like, who are your friends and who is your husband that this is something that you think would even cross either one of their minds? This is bizarre to me. And also, let me say this before I give more commentary. I think that, that Kiara Sheard is a grown ass woman and that she can set whatever boundaries that she feels are appropriate for her home, whether they make sense to me or not. It's her goddamn house. She could do whatever she wants in it. If you don't want people in your house for whatever reason, you don't want them in your house. That's your business. That's your business. That's how that's your business for your house. However, however. If the underlying reason that you don't want people in your house is because you think that your friends would want to share your husband or your husband would be inappropriate with your friends, hence the don't get too comfortable, I don't care how good you trust or whatever that is, who don't you trust, sis? Who don't you trust? And if you fundamentally don't trust either your friends or your husband, sending your friends to a hotel will not change the underlying issue. It's like you're treating the symptoms, but you're not treating the disease. Like somebody needs to go. I don't know if it's your husband or whether it's your friend, but the idea that someone who believes that they are close enough to you 
to ask to stay in your home or to think that they might be invited to stay in your home. I think that's like a close friend, like the type of friend that might be in your wedding or some such. You're sending them to a hotel because you don't want them in your home. You want your space. I get it. You're sending them to your home. You're sending them to a hotel because you think they might want to try to share your husband. That's. I don't know, Kier. We'll never be friends, especially not after I'm finished with my commentary today. However, if I were friends with her and I had read this quote, I would be like, girl, what? I would be so embarrassed. Like, this is what you think of me? Like, you don't want me in your house because you think I'm going to try to share your man? No, girl, I just want a place to stay for free. It's not that deep. But I'm like, where is this this coming from? Because I don't feel like this is just a regular mindset. Like, have you had a friend that slept with one of your men before? Has your husband who, I think he's relatively new. Yes, they got married in December of 2020. So just over a year and change. Like, has he been cheating and acting up already? Where you feel like he might be inappropriate with your friends in your house at that? If he's done something and you've decided to like work through it, but you're not fully at a trust point yet. Like, I understand that. I would also say too that, you know, maybe putting this information out there that makes it seem like you don't trust your husband is not really the best way to mend whatever's going on with y'all. This sounds like it maybe could be some passive aggressive behavior that you may want to work out with a therapist and not with a reporter from page six. <sighs> maybe. I don't, I don't quite know. I think I keep looking at this quote and just reading it in its entirety. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. I was talking about it on my Facebook page and a couple of the readers weighed in and they were like, yo, she grew up in like church of God and Christ. Like they different, they different. They think about stuff differently. You're trying to apply like your, your casual attendance at like a Baptist church to, to the thinking of, of church of God and Christ It's different D which I can accept. And so maybe if her friends and her husband all grew up in, in the church of God and Christ, like maybe this makes sense to them. But casual attendance at a Baptist church, I mean, even though my grandfather was a pastor, that's why I'd be like randomly quoting Bible verses all the time. No, I would feel a way if my girl had made this quote somewhere and been like, girl, I just, I'm not trying to fuck your husband. Like, where's, where are you getting this from? No. And then this last part, like she's talking about, you know how they say like a lot of single women can't give you counsel, but I was single. I was able to tell my married friends good advice. I definitely think there's such a thing as boundaries. Like, yes, I definitely agree about the part about boundaries. Like she seems to be singling out her single women. And I was like, what's up? Can your married friends, they could stay at your house. Like do your married friends not have vaginas? Like, would your husband not be interested in those vaginas or, or would your married friends not? I don't understand. Like, are you, is your assumption that only single women would be trying to fuck your husband, but married women wouldn't? You know, married folks who cheat, like the, the old adage is like, if you're going to cheat, you cheat with other people that have as much to lose as you do. Married people often do cheat with other married people. It's not just single people that fuck married men. You know that, right? I think she just said some shit out loud that like, maybe she was, she'd been told and never really thought about it. Like what she was really saying, because it seems when she starts talking, she realizes some way midway through that like what she's saying doesn't really make a lot of sense because then she starts talking about single women they can't give you counsel but then I was single and I did this and it just it all just came out wrong sis it just that ain't mm -mm. that's 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 that wasn't what you wanted to say you said it but that wasn't what she wanted to say. But I did read that she um that she doubled down on it somewhere and I would go look that up but I really just don't care that much. Again, her house she can govern her castle however she sees fit. But if she's going to do interviews about it and say like wild shit, I mean, you just got to expect people to have commentary on it. Um, I got lots of like fucked up opinions that I just don't say publicly because I don't want, you know, hear people's mouth about it. She might do well to to adopt maybe that perspective. Final thing on this, right? <sighs> Two more things. There's this this weird thing that married women, not all some married women, I'm just going to say some because some covers like some is, is very subjective and can cover like anything from a few to many. Some married women have this thing that they do where they get married and then they're just like in fear of single people. Like they see single women as like these these vultures or these threats or I just I'm not really quite sure where it comes from because no one's born married. 
I'm like, when you were a single woman, like, were you actively trying to fuck other women's husbands, husbands of your friends, no less, in their marital home? Like, was that something that you were up to? And so if it wasn't, then where do you get this idea that, like, that's the desire of single women? Like, this whole, like, since I'm not sharing my man, so you can't stay at my house because I'm not sharing my man. Like, as a single woman, like, if you stayed at someone's house, was your expectation that they would share their man with you because you were spending the night? And if no, then where are you getting this shit from? I just, I really don't understand, like, the... the the animosity for the single like okay like you got married you made a life choice you signed a marriage certificate like you didn't have like a a conversion like you had a wedding ceremony but you didn't have like a you know Paul Saul on the way to Damascus like it's you didn't have a conversion like it's not a baptism you're not an entirely different person the day after a marriage ceremony like you didn't get dipped in water like what the fuck I don't I don't really get that The other thing too, this is my final thought, and this applies to marriages as much as relationships, right? If you want to stay happily married, I can tell you from the experience of fucking it up, how not to do that. If you want to stay happily married, it may behoove you not to bring undue criticism to your marriage. I think I knew Kiara Sheard got married. I'm not really into gospel music like that, not modern stuff. I listen to like James Cleveland on on repeat. That's the same gospel music my mother listened to in the 70s. I didn't know anything about her. I think I might have known she was engaged. I might have known she got married, but it wasn't something that sat on my radar. And now I know she's married. It seems like she doesn't trust her husband. It seems like she doesn't trust her friends. It seems like she's in the media being passive aggressive about something that's going on in her life, either with her friends or her husband. Before I went and read an article that had quotes about exactly what she said, I was seeing all these hot takes all over social media that was basically calling her husband a single husband married whore who's a a cue and a landscaper. And people were like, surely the lawns that he's tending to are attached to houses where he could be fucking all types of women. Why would you put your husband out there for people to speak of him? that way in the same way that why would you put your friends out there to be spoken of that way because everyone's like well who's the hoe your husband your friends or both like we just talked about this with kim and kanye like we see this stuff as like a quote in a in an article kiara sheard gospel royalty kiara sheard that like sings this song but like she is a woman who is married to a man. She has a mother. She has a friend circle. And I imagine that her actual life right now is a bit of pure hell. Her friends probably ain't really fucking with her right now. And her husband probably looking at her sideways, reading all the crazy shit that people saying about him. She's not having a good week, which she brought on herself. Sometimes, I mean, I sell shirts that say this, but before I was selling shirts that say this, I was saying this. This is how we got the shirts. Shutting the fuck up is free. It is. Next topic. This one, this is also a great case of shutting the fuck up is free. Thandie Newton, for reasons that I do not understand, has been doing interviews talking about colorism. So she talked to Harper's Bazaar and she had some thoughts about colorism when she spoke to them. And then she did this interview with the Associated Press on video. And I guess the stuff she said to Harper's Bazaar didn't, wasn't crazy enough. So she went extra crazy when she spoke to the Associated Press. And she is promoting a new film. It premiered at Sundance last month. Her film is called In God's Country. She plays a college professor. I'm reading this from Excerpt of Essence as well. She plays a college professor suffering a tragic loss who gets into a steadily escalating conflict with two hunters who trespass on her land. This does not sound like some shit I'm going to go watch. That's not the point of what we're talking about, though. So she does this interview with the Associated Press, and everyone's like, where the fuck did this come from? No one asked for this. Your girl, because I can't claim her, your girl does this interview with the Associated Press, And she discussed, I'm reading this on Essence, she discussed colorism. And she said, no, 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 let let me me quote this. 
So she does this interview and she starts talking about the prejudice that she has received as a light skinned woman. And as soon as I saw that quote, I was like, girl, stop, 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 stop. For your own sake, stop. Just like, okay, so like white women get upset that, you know, they've been called Karens and they're like, stop calling me Karen. It's hurtful. It's painful. Stop calling me Karen. It's prejudice. It makes me feel bad, blah, blah, blah. And people are like, yo, you are a white woman. You have 50 million fucking privileges. You go eat this Karen shit and like it. Shut up. That is how people feel about light-skinned people complaining about like, oh, I've received prejudice because I'm light-skinned. Nobody wants to hear that shit. Have people said hurtful things to you because you're light-skinned? Absolutely. No one's fucking denying that. Is it anywhere on par with the shit that happens to dark-skinned black people who experience colorism? No. And there's no such thing as like reverse colorism, just like there's no fucking thing as reverse racism. You getting your feelings hurt because someone called you Karen does not compare to someone like fearing for their life every time there's a traffic stop. Like it's just not the same. That's what light skinned people sound like complaining about colorism. Like you got every other privilege when it comes to this shit. Don't nobody want to hear you complaining about like, oh, somebody thought you were stuck up or sedity because you're light skinned. It just doesn't compare to being say like less likely to get a job or more likely to be arrested If so, arrested and charged and found guilty, more likely to receive a harsher sentence solely based on the amount of melanin in your skin. Like, it's just, it's not the same. Dandy goes on. She says she has a dark-skinned mother. Saw pictures of her mother. Her mother, in fact, is a dark-skinned woman. Dandy is biracial. Her father is white. And that's why she's so light. Okay. She goes on to say, It's been very painful to have women who look like my mom feel like I'm not representing them. Thandy girl, thandy girl. I understand what she's saying to a degree. It's like the idea of say like, okay, we we get the first black president who's technically biracial, right? His blackness is his blackness gets a bump because he's married to a brown skinned woman from the south side of Chicago. It's a really big deal that Michelle Obama was a brown skinned wife. And the idea was he has a real black wife as though light skinned black is lesser black or off brand black. That's what the implication is. Again, it's it can be hurtful. It's annoying. I feel you. It's in no way in the same comparison as to what dark skinned people might feel. Also, let's put the excitement over Michelle Obama's brownness in its proper context in that way too often when you see black men who are accomplished, we would see them with very, very light skinned wives or white wives. So Barack Obama being a man of accomplishment and intentionally and purposefully and willfully going to get a brown woman as his mate. It's a brown woman being centered as opposed to being sidelined as the bestie or the help or, I don't know, all the many ways that brown-skinned women have been sidelined and maligned over the years. Here's where Thandy gets really fucked up. I'm going to reread the first part. I'm going to give you the second part. She says, it's been very painful to have women who look like my mom, feel I'm not representing them, that I'm taking from them, taking their men, taking their work, taking their truth. Huh? Well, one, she's been married to a white guy for like 20 some odd years. So I was like, taking their men? Whose men are you taking? Like, are you you cheating on your husband? Like, I don't understand what you're saying, sis. Like, what? She also says somewhere else in the article, she says, I've wanted so desperately to apologize every day to darker skinned actresses. To me, that sounds patronizing as fuck. I'm not dark skinned. So when I first read the shit, I was like, you know what? I'm going to lead that to dark skinned women to determine how they feel about that because maybe they think that that's cool. Then he goes on. She was like, I'm sorry. I'm literally reading this quote. I want you to know that I'm reading it for essence because you're going to be like, Demetri, she didn't say that shit. She said this shit. She said, I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. Ma'am? Ma'am. I was like, Regina George, is that you? Like, what? Why would you phrase that shit? One, I don't know anyone who was asking her for an apology. 
Like who was asking Thandie Newton? Who was like, I want you to apologize to me for, for taking my roles. I want you to apologize to me for being light skinned. Like, I don't, I've, is that a request that I've never heard this request from, from anyone towards a light skinned person? Like, I want you to apologize for being light skinned. I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. What kind of fucking apology is that? One, nobody asked for an apology, but if you're going to apologize, I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. What? I don't know what she I don't know what she hoped to accomplish with this. Like, if you wanted to promote the film, I mean, people know what the film is now, but nobody's talking about it just in the same way with Kiara Shear. Nobody's talking about whatever you went to page six to discuss. They just talk about the crazy shit you said. Nobody's running out to see Danny Newton's film because she apologized for being the one chosen. And I didn't watch the whole video because all this shit is on video, by the way. I didn't watch the whole video of her doing this. I just saw the video clips and she's having like a full meltdown I'm sorry, I'm the one chosen. People feel like I'm not representing them, that I'm taking from them, taking their men, taking their work, taking their truth. That I'm taking from them, I could kind of feel maybe where she's coming from with that. Like maybe she's saying that this is what people have accused me of, that they say I'm taking from them, I'm taking their men, I'm taking their work, I'm taking their truth. I can see her saying, this is not what I'm saying about me. This is what I'm saying other people have said that I'm doing. I can maybe work with her on that. I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. I don't even know what to do with that. Like, girl, girl. She said she's retiring after this movie role. She said she's 49 and that she's, quote, been a successful black actress for many years. And so she said, this is her last role and that she's done. And I was like, girl, I don't think that's a choice after these quotes. Ain't no black people going to the theater to support you after this shit. Maybe a lone, equally confused, light-skinned woman will go on with you. But girl, you done lost your audience with this shit. I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. Ma'am. Ma'am. I'm reading this story in Essence. Could you imagine if she said that shit to Essence? Folks would have stormed the goddamn office just for rerunning the quote. Nobody asked for the apology to begin with, but you wanted to give an apology. I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. You know how sometimes I like to give advice and be like, this is what you said. This is how you could have said it. We were talking about the, the, the podcaster from South Africa. He wanted to ask Ari Lennox a crazy question. I was like, you could have phrased it this way. That would have gone over better. I don't even know. The apology is just weird on its own. I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. I can't even give that a girl, I guess. I just, girl, what were you thinking? So that's our episode. We'll be back on Friday. I do, I do think I should give you a heads up that I am going to be taking a little hiatus from February 14th to March 15th. Um, I've got some work stuff that I've got to work out. I've been talking for a very long time about I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And a lot of it is work in progress, but it's not work that is finished. Um, And I actually need to finish it, especially when I'm trying to like, you know, get on a plane and move to another continent this year. Doing the podcast right now, I um, I can't. I'm not able to do both. So I'm going to have to take a L on this end for a while. Hopefully you'll be back here with me when I return. But we have another episode to come and we'll talk about it a little further before I go away. Okay? I know. I know. I'm sorry. So I will be back again on Friday. We'll have our full episode then. In the meantime, if you have not picked up your merch for Ratchet and Respectable, I'm going on hiatus. I'm not like quitting. The new merch is available on DemetriaLucas.com. I think I have the new hoodies in almost every size. The black and gold, the shut the fuck up is free, and the feminist lips and ratchet hips. You got to go to the site and see what's available. I know the t-shirts for shut the fuck up is free and... um feminist lips and ratchet hips are gone. Those sold out pretty quick. So thank you. I appreciate your purchases. Those will not be restocked before summer, just FYI. So that's that. Anything that we haven't talked about, we'll talk about next week. And also while I'm on hiatus, I'll still be on social media. Um, Probably not as often as I am now, because I really do want to buckle down and focus on some work stuff, but I won't be like completely gone. I just won't be here. Okay. We'll talk again Friday. Don't freak out. Don't freak out, okay?
We'll talk again on Friday. Okay. Bye.